Hey there, guys. All right, today we are back with some more overly sarcastic productions. Decided, let's talk about, let's get back into more history summarized. This time, Cleopatra. Um, don't really got anything to add here at the beginning of this video, so make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. All right, good. Got that out of the way. Let's dive right in. So, Cleopatra, pretty straightforward story. Shakespeare tells us that she's the gorgeous queen of Egypt and master of the art of seduction who banged her way across Rome to get power, ultimately ruining her own empire before committing cobra-assisted suicide. Couldn't be easier, right? <laughs> Wrong. Mm. For starters, never trust a leading question, but secondly, and actually on topic, Cleopatra's real story is rather less uniformly disparaging and far more interesting. History's pervasive problem with- Hey boys, I see you're playing a transcontinental game of musical thrones in an attempt to become sole monarch. Room for one more. Pompey, Caesar, Antonius, Lepidus, Sextus, Grippa. Brutus, Octavian, Cassius, Crass. Egypt's final pharaoh is that she usually plays a side character in Roman history rather than ever being the protagonist in her own right. And her story usually- You sound useful. And cute. Jinx, you owe me a slave. Get lost, lady. Ew, she's cuties. Gross, royalty. For some reason I trust, don't trust you. But your brother. Your armies sure would have helped with the Parthians. <laughs> oh yeah, Crassus, you're dead. Usually gets smeared in the shuffle because of it. It also didn't help that the only historical sources that we have on the matter are from Romans. Hence the Rome centrism and the cast do, do, do. Okay, of her yeah, character as her a seductress things. with the habit of ruining otherwise perfectly blameless great men. But such is life. So, to get at the woman behind the myth, let's do some history. Cleopatra's story actually starts 300 years earlier when a Greek kid named Alexander decided that he wanted to own the entire planet. Mm. So he marched eastward, beat the Persians, and conquered everything in sight. When he died 20 minutes later without a clear line of succession, his generals scrambled to claim their corner of the fragmenting Macedonian Empire. The general Ptolemy got his hands on Egypt and became King Ptolemy, kickstarting a dynasty that I can only describe as deeply unpleasant to trace. And speaking of, click the video in the top right if you want to watch me lose my freaking mind attempting to document the chronology of that lineage, mm. but unsettling family politics aside, the Ptolemaic dynasty ruled during the so-called Hellenistic era, where Alexander's successors spread Hellenic, that is to say Greek, culture out to Syria, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. Although our story takes place along the Nile, the ancestry of the Ptolemaic rulers and the culture they promoted were unmistakably Greek. Fast forward three centuries and we have Cleopatra VII and her younger brother Ptolemy XIII. Both lived in the beautiful city of Alexandria, the first century BC's knowledge capital of the entire Mediterranean world. Is this from a 7th grade origin? It has to be. Between the superbly yeah, stocked library, the abundance of mathematicians, poets, scientists, philosophers, and rhetoricians, and the fact that she was a princess, the young Cleopatra had the best education possible in the entire Greek world. And unlike a lot of her party-crazed ancestors, she actually put in the effort. She would have been raised on Homer, Herodotus, Plato, Aristotle, all of the classical works we know, and a lot of the ones that we've lost in the meantime. After memorization, hmm. the focus shifted to composition, making arguments, telling stories in various Typical assignments include Write a deathbed speech from the perspective of Odysseus. Tell a fable of Aesop in your own words. Is the world governed by divine providence? Was Helen at fault for the Trojan War? What constitutes a good life? I don't know why I'm going British. Varied ways, not just knowing, but. Well, I also can't do Egyptian or a Greek accent, so. You get British. But thinking, and ultimately, speaking. And that's the crucial point. During her life, Cleopatra wasn't described as spellbindingly gorgeous, but rather she was captivating. She was known to be the ultimate conversationalist, and that's how she won people over. None of her ancestors before her were exceptionally intelligent, and none of them bothered to even learn how to speak Egyptian. But Cleopatra could charmingly convince anyone of anything in one of ten different languages. Bottom line is the lady was smart, okay? Because I feel like that point is all too often ignored in favor of how supposedly hot she was. Mm. So anyway. 
When Cleopatra's father, Ptolemy XII, died, the throne passed to her prepubescent brother, Ptolemy XIII, and she served as his co-monarch. Interfamilial scheming was no stranger to the Ptolemies, and after a couple years of power jockeying between them, Ptolemy made the political and military friends he needed to force Cleopatra into exile. But at the same time, another, much, much bigger civil war was afoot. Namely, Caesar was busy staging a gigantic coup and chasing Pompey across the entire Mediterranean. Now, Pompey was close with the Ptolemy kids on account of business with their father, and Cleopatra's hope was that she could promise Egypt's armies in his fight against Caesar if he kicked out her brother and made her queen. Solid plan. But the boy King Ptolemy decided- Uncle Pompey, Uncle Pompey, look up King now and I have a new Xbox. Dava Pompeius Magnus. May I propose an exchange of services in the name of Alliance? ...that Caesar was a better bet, so he had Pompey well, killed like... the second he arrived in Alexandria. Caesar was deeply irritated at having his victory yoinked, so he angrily plopped himself down in the royal palace. Cleopatra saw an opening and got to work. Casually strolling into the palace wasn't an option on the count of her still being in exile, so she stealthed her way in. Stories of her coming to Caesar neatly wrapped in a fine rug to get past the guards likely derived from the queen being stuffed in a much less conspicuous laundry bag instead. And by the way, when you do put your queen in the laundry, it's machine wash cold and then tumble dry low. There's not a tag, so it's hard to figure out sometimes. Anyway, as Shakespeare would have it, the whirlwind romance begins from that very minute, with Cleopatra's first major act being one of seduction. Now, that wouldn't be a particularly high bar to clear, given Caesar had an affair with every woman who so much as made eye contact huh. with him, but the evidence points to any Zeus? romance between the duo happening a little further down the line. While I don't doubt that Cleopatra eventually developed googly eyes for the sharpest cheekbones in the Mediterranean, she needed an ally much more than a boyfriend. That was just a bonus. Likewise, Caesar probably realized after about two minutes of talking to her that she was a far more useful ally and grain provider than the young, dumb, and already on thin ice Ptolemy. They both had what the other wanted, a good friend in a soon-to-be high place. But it wasn't as simple as high-fiving and conquering the world together. Ptolemy and his army blockaded Alexandria, and the new power couple was stuck in a besieged royal palace for six months. Caesar put his neck out by betting on Cleopatra, and side note, that's not the kind of thing that Caesar, of all people, would do for just some crush. Cleopatra was clearly a valuable ally in Caesar's eyes, and not just a pretty face and figure. However, by the time that Caesar's reinforcements arrived to break the siege of Alexandria and defeat Ptolemy's armies, the two had spent plenty of quality time together. They were lost in endless conversation, she was pregnant, they were tagging each other in memes, it was true love. <laughs> and by this memes. point, Caesar had conquered the entire Mediterranean. But instead of immediately going back to Rome to be dictator, he spent an extra year touring Egypt with Cleopatra. When he returns to Rome, he publicly... Attention Romans, as a side note on my new dictatorial initiatives, Cleopatra is my new girlfriend and my child is in line to inherit the throne of Egypt. Acknowledged Cleopatra's son Caesarion as his child. While Caesarion wasn't in line to gain much in Rome, he would spend the next two decades... No, this has nothing to do with how I'm psychologically tortured by the fact that I'll never be Alexander the Great. Stop asking. ...preparing to become Pharaoh of Egypt. But our most pressing concern here is Cleopatra, who now fully and finally became queen, and she wasted no time in carefully tending... Your savior is here. ...to a kingdom that its rulers had largely ignored for centuries. As queen, Cleopatra took on the role of Isis incarnate. Every bit of iconography, be it art, dress, coinage, or ceremony, all proclaimed the same message. Hi, my name is Cleopatra, and I will be your goddess. While Isis was essentially a universal deity in the Hellenistic era, Cleopatra had two main roles to fill. The protector of justice, and the mother of... well... everything. To that end, actually being a mother was great PR for her because she really got to lean into her relationship with the fertility of the Nile River. Agriculture was everything on the Nile, and after her father went bankrupt by bribing Rome not to annex Egypt, she made effective use of a strong bureaucracy to make sure the economy ran smoothly. When your entire country lives and dies by the flooding of the river, there really was no room to be laissez-faire about it. And as it happened, she had to deal with a string of droughts in the early years of her reign, which she handled remarkably well. The nice. Ptolemaic rulers were the most notorious party animals on Earth, and Cleopatra was no exception to that affinity for pageantry. She differed in that she utilized that revelry to make religious and political statements, and she recognized that being a queen necessitated actually doing work. Whenever she wasn't hosting a royal function or ceremony, she was reading and writing letters, addressing complaints from people up and down the Nile. She was also very attentive to the strife between Greeks and Egyptians. We'll see you ever no peace by it.
descriptions. Uh, Most civil disturbances stem from that. Hi, Bayek. No, it won't. Stop asking and go back to assassinating my enemies for me. Simple divide. So Cleopatra presented herself as a queen for both her fellow Greeks and for the population of Egypt that was, well, you know, Egyptian. Because no one in her family had bothered to do that before her. She held corruption accountable, provided for her people in equal measure, embraced the Egyptian aspects of her role as pharaoh, and, again, actually spoke Egyptian. Every other Ptolemaic king used the throne as an excuse to party all day and all night, but not Cleopatra. In her 18 years as queen, her reign can be summarized with just a single sentiment. She cared. Meanwhile, on the Roman side of the Mediterranean, which is to say the entire rest of the Mediterranean by this point, Julius Caesar got super murdered and his adopted <laughs> son and second-in-command were busy chasing down the assassins in Greece. After that mess cleared up, the young Caesar Octavian took command of the west, while Marcus Antonius held on to the east, and with it, most of the land and sea that bordered Egypt. As the conventional story goes, Antonius summoned Cleopatra to the Anatolian city of Tarsus, and she delayed to build the suspense, but they fell in love the instant and they met and it was immediately off to start a dynasty together. Again, no. Beyond the suspected eyelash fluttering and the known fact that Antonius would bang anything that even moved, let's look at some practicalities first. A decade earlier, Rome suffered an embarrassing loss against Parthia. Caesar was planning a campaign to avenge it, but the dying business threw off his schedule a little bit. Antonius, sitting pretty in the east and looking to inherit Caesar's legacy, was hell-bent on launching that campaign. But Rome was actively broke from fighting the assassins, and Parthian campaigns were stupid expensive. No one else but Cleopatra's Egypt could fund that expedition. On her end of things, Egypt could only stay independent by Rome's goodwill, and what better will is there than love? The story of the following decade is a quiet one for Cleopatra, and- The, uh, pacing of this seems a little weird, and where we're going in, like, I'm like, little- Jumpy. And almost solely revolves around her lavish and ruinous affair with Antonius. But here we need to consider the exclusively pro Octavian sources that we have for this. As far as anyone writing during the Roman Empire is concerned, Caesar and Octavian were the winners and therefore the good guys. That's why with Caesar, Cleopatra is portrayed as a mysterious and dramatic ally, but for eventual loser Antonius, Cleopatra is said to have bewitched him into a life of enslaved debauchery and ruined everything. So after things got going, yeah, they did love each other and she had three kids by him, but there's Damn. more actual strategy going on here than the ancient Roman tabloids would have you believe. Cleopatra's solo story stays quiet in the Roman sources because there's no scandal in efficient government. That said, Cleopatra had yeah. a string of good times in the following decade. Her empire was prosperous, secured by bloodline, and enhanced by the small but generous gift of Cilicia, Syria, the Levant, Cyrene, and Cyprus. Damn. You know, nothing too fancy, just a return to the full extent of the old Ptolemaic Empire. It's one of those feel-good gifts, like scented candles. So basically, in 37 BC, Cleopatra was rolling in it. She had pretty much everything she wanted, and when Antonius set off to conquer Parthia the next year, she would become empress of the entire east. Cities were already minting coins with both of their faces on them. He was Dionysus, and she was Isis. The pair of rulers was literally a match made in heaven. Uh, except for the fact that after that, it, it wasn't, mm. like, at all. So, unfortunately, the Parthian campaign was a total disaster, and Antonius lost a third of his army just on the retreat. Ooh. Whoops. Cleopatra was still doing really well, but it's after 36 that her beloved Antonius started to be more of a liability than a help. At this point, Octavian smelled blood, so he cleverly gave Antonius an impossible choice. He sent his long-suffering sister- Hey, loser. I saw you got your ass handed to you in Parthia. Please, accept the humiliating gift of my help and the wife you clearly don't care about. Catch you later, dork. And Antonius' <laughs> actual Roman wife, Octavia, to the east along with 2,000 soldiers. The message was clear. Reject Cleopatra and accept- Or, you know, wallow in your failure and give me all the PR ammo I need to make you look like the biggest traitor Rome has ever seen. Be your call. 5D chess by Octavian. Roman help or forfeit the army and your wife and keep your Egyptian harlot queen. Cleopatra couldn't lose her ally, so it was do or die. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Professionalism. So she laid on the affection to win Antonius over. I mean, it worked, but now they were in it together until the end, and the writing was just starting to appear on the wall. Your totes doom. If you are any more screwed, we could be using you to fasten together the crumbling remnants of the empire you ruined. It's not even funny how inextricably effed this entire situation is for you both. Like, wow. 
By Zeus, you two are ruined. So unbelievably bone. Wall. To turn things around, Cleopatra did what her ancestors did best and threw a celebration. With <laughs> the alliance of Antonius and Cleopatra stronger and more interdependent than ever, they decided to flex their might. During citywide festivities, Cleopatra was declared Queen of Kings, with her son Caesarion, proclaimed to be Caesar's rightful heir and a very pointed jab at Octavian, declared King of Kings and successor to the throne of Egypt. As for her children with Antonius, Alexander Helios was crowned King of Armenia, Media, and Parthia. The last two they didn't even own yet. Cleopatra Selene was given Crete and Cyrene, while Ptolemy Philadelphus got Phoenicia, Syria, and Cilicia, almost all of which belongs to Rome just a few years earlier. As far as the happy couple was concerned, the entire East belongs to their family, and they had the pan-imperial iconography to match. Egypt and the Roman East were gone, and in its place was the new empire of Antonius and Cleopatra together. However, this was Alrighty, everyone in favor of murdering the pants off of the traitor Antony and his annoying clingy girlfriend say I A colossal slap in the face to Rome, and Octavian had a very easy time convincing the people and his armies that Marcus Hi. Antonius had sacrificed his Roman identity to consort with this dangerous and dastardly Egyptian queen. I go into both the propaganda war and the actual war between Octavian and Antonius in this video here, but for our purposes, Cleopatra's grand gesture at the so-called donations of Alexandria became her complete undoing. After their defeat at Actium, again, up over here, mm. click it, go watch it, it was game over. The final months and moments of the star-crossed couple have been unsurprisingly romanticized to death, literally, so there's no way to actually know what's up, but we can take some educated guesses. After Actium, Antonius was a despondent mess, and his soldiers were defecting hourly, but Cleopatra was still planning ways to escape and turn the tables while consoling Antonius at every turn. That strength of character is nothing short of of astounding. Even here, in total defeat, she never quit. In the end, there was no defeating Octavian, though she threatens to burn the entirety of her treasure if he tried any- It's not about the treasure. i sending a message. And that message. Screw you. Anything sneaky, he captured her and demanded I that she be Joker the main voice, trophy in his victory parade. And that was something that she would not do. With her lover already dead and her children by him promised to live with the infinitely accommodating Octavia, Cleopatra instead chose death. It wouldn't have been by a snake bite, though. Those really hurt, and she had painless poisons for that kind of thing. Per the leaked hmm. will of Antonius, the two were buried together in Alexandria, where they've gone undiscovered to this day. So, that is the roller coaster that was Cleopatra's life. It's been twisted every which way to suit the needs of 2,000 years worth of writers, but under the slabs of romanticized gossip, Cleopatra was a woman who used her genius, her wealth, her power, and to a certain extent her sexuality to accomplish her many goals. Throughout her life, she planned carefully and worked hard because she cared. And, if only briefly in the grand scheme of things, she achieved some insane stuff. She's arguably the most powerful woman in history, and you could easily make the case that during her lifetime she was the smartest, most accomplished person on the planet. But of course she also had boobs and did the sex sometimes, which is clearly the takeaway historians, playwrights, and storytellers should be focusing on. That surely won't give anyone a dangerously reductive impression of one of history's most interesting people, or diminish a lifetime of world-shaping accomplishments to two boyfriends and a snake. Snake, yeah. Alright, and that was History Summarized Cleopatra. This was pretty good. Um, it felt a bit janky to me in terms of pacing and time period a little bit. Uh, at least there in the first like few minutes where it's we were following the timeline and then he jumped back and then he jumps back to the normal timeline and jumped back again to explain something and then, and then it was straightforward for the rest of the video. But it still seemed a bit janky but of course this is an old video from them so i'm willing to forgive it oh yeah that was history summarized cleopatra by overly sarcastic productions i hope you guys enjoyed remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more and i will see you guys in the next video peace